everyone. My name is Jenna Weiss, and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs at the Jewish Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this talk, New York Between Art and Life, Dancing the City, featuring Deborah Hay, Anna Janowski, Ralph Lemon, moderated by Andre Lopecki. This talk is presented in conjunction with the exhibition, New York, 1962 to 1964, on view at the Jewish Museum through January 8th, 2023. We encourage you to visit if you are able to do so. Now I would like to briefly introduce our speakers. Choreographer and performer Deborah Hay began her career in the early 1960s with the Judson Dance Theater. In her five decades at the vanguard of choreographic experimentation, she has helped redefine the field of dance with her revolutionary work and influential publications. Anna Janewski is curator in the Department of Media and Performance at the Museum of Modern Art. She has organized performances by Yvonne Rayner, Simone Forti, Boris Sharma, and Jerome Bell, among others. She co-organized the 2018 exhibition, Judson Dance Theater, The Work Is Never Done, with T.G. Max and Martha Joseph. She regularly contributes to and co-edits publications on performance, the body, and the history of art in Eastern Europe. Ralph Lemon is a choreographer, writer, visual artist, and the artistic director of Cross Performance, a company dedicated to the creation of cross-cultural and cross-disciplinary performance and presentation. His works are in the collections of museums, such as the Walker Art Center, Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Whitney Museum. He has been honored with numerous grants and awards, including one of the first Doris Duke Performing Artist Awards, a Heinz Family Foundation Award, MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. He was elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2021. And finally, Andre Lepecki is professor and chairperson at the Department of Performance Studies at New York University. He has curated festivals and projects for MoMA Warsaw, MoMA PS1, the Hayward Gallery, Haus der Kunst Munich, and the Sydney Biennial, among others. He is the editor of several anthologies on performance and dance theory, an author of Exhausting Dance, Performance and the Politics of Movement, and Singularities, Dance in the Age of Performance. In 2008, he received the International Association of Art Critics Award for co-curating and directing the authorized restaging of Alan Caprow's 18 Happenings in Six Parts at Performa 07. It is my pleasure to welcome him to begin this conversation. We are meeting here today thanks to an exhibition that's happening at the Jewish Museum that looks at New York City between 1962 and 1964. And we have here Deborah Hay, who's one of the founding members of one of the very important movements that were happening in, in that time, in that period in New York City, which is the Judson Church Group, right? It, which is a a moment of experimentation in dance in New York that has been percolating and informing the work of so many people, not only in New York City, but across the globe in many, many different ways and across generations, actually, right? It's, it's something that it seems to be a force of experimentation at that moment, Deborah, that informs your work. And by informing your work, informs the work of so many others uh, that have responded in ways around this notion of experimentation and dance that exploded the field of dance also into different kinds of ways of thinking about it, right? So I, I can see the work of Ralph like also like addressing constantly this notion of experimentation and at the same time questioning it also in many ways. And then like I can see the work of Anna Yanevsky as a curator of, of performance at MoMA inviting both of you actually to be at MoMA in different occasions, thinking about like, how do you want to present your work, right? But also like thinking about how the past informs not only the present, but also opens up the possibility of thinking about the future of dance. And that's like, I was thinking like, if there's something to think about when we go to a museum to look at New York City in 1962, 1964, you know, I immediately start thinking about the relationship between dance and pastness and how is dance it- Dance and what? And the past. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right? 
Um, can we talk about dance in the past? Can we see dance in the past? What is it that we see when we're looking at dance, which is from the past with mostly pictures and some black and white video footage? So there's that, like, but also like I was thinking in this particular exhibition and Ralph actually sent an email to the three of us, to the four of us <laughs> before, uh, before we met, which has to do, okay, 1962, 1964, in the United States is a very particular moment. There's the March on Washington, right? There's the civil rights movement going on. The art scene in New York City is particularly segregated, right? Particularly the visual arts, right? But not only. Um, how can we then, like, if you want to think about the past of dance, are you just thinking about those works specifically? Or can we think about ways in which those movements are actually responding or not responding to other movements which are political movements right that are taking place at the time so i guess like maybe it's a lot but maybe there's a way <laughs> that a conversation around that yeah. especially with new movers you know yeah um and and you know thinking in, I mean, i'll just shut up because i'm talking too much but you know to remind that all of you also have a relationship to the written word. So, oh, this is blurry, but Deborah Hay has published my several books. I have some of them here. My Body the Buddhist is one of my favorites. Ralph Lemon has, you know, I have two of your books here, Ralph, <laughs> Come Home, Charlie Patton and Geography. And then I have the catalog of the Judson Dance Theater exhibition at MoMA. So, you also like in your work as choreographers, you're also people who write and have a particular relationship to the page, to the written word, which makes me also think about legacy, makes me think again and another mechanism of think about past and future. Where is it that movement is located? You know, so all of that. So maybe that's a beginning. And uh, I don't know who wants to pick up any of these threads yeah. from now. You know, I, I could start just simply because um, and refer to the show and, and uh, the, the talking about Jetson. And I'll tell you, one of the things that really um, most uh, knocked me out in that exhibit was the footage of Cunningham from Antique Meat. I saw that piece because I was on tour with the company in 1964. So I saw it live a lot, but looking at it in, in the frame, the tiny black and white frame, I was really blown away by the, by the humor and by the um, uh, er, uh, just the, the permission Cage, I mean, Merce, separate from Cage, separate from Bob, through movement. I was blown away by mm. the permission he was already taking. Mm -hmm. And that um, influence, I didn't think just dance. When I looked at that, I thought, my God, this is, I, I can't imagine that that footage did not influence artists of all of all disciplines. It, it just seemed, um, uh, I mean, I couldn't stop looking at it. I just, the jokes and the beauty and the, and the rigor and the way it was performed. Um, and, and so it, just to say that uh, Merce was around before Judson. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, uh, and as was Bob Rauschenberg and, and Cage. And, and um, I, I just want to step in for acknowledging their profound effect, uh, that's mm -hmm. their profound effect in the arts, yeah. just as the most general experience of my, my one of the really major moments for me in that, in that show. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had, 
I had that same response to, you know, Andre, you're bringing up Judson. I think the radical, I think as far as I think about it as a, the, the dance person in me, you know, a radical began with Merce and, and Cage for sure, you know, and that instigated Judson, right? So I think that's kind of a ground zero. But then at the, at the, you know, they were also showing Balanchine, right? At the, mm -hmm. and, you know, so there's this other level of radical, you know, again, bringing up the issues of race during that time. And, you know, Balanchine hired Ar Arthur Mitchell in 1955. Mm -hmm. And even more profoundly choreographed Agon with Arthur Mitchell and Diana Adams, you know, a, wh a white woman, a black man. And this was like, this was not happening anywhere, right? And I think he knew exactly what was going on. So, you know, I think of that mm -hmm. radical too um, was kind of amazing. And the pushback he got, he got for that kind of artistic decision-making, whatever it was for him, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's been really interesting to kind of think about, you know, how these levels of radical that were happening at the time were including a larger political landscape versus just the aesthetics, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my thinking. Yeah, and, in, and, and specifically with dance, like the radicalness includes the presence of bodies that otherwise would not be present necessarily. And particularly in Balanchine, I think that's that's really an incredible point. And it's interesting, like in the exhibition, they put both the Cunningham video and the Balanchine in the same room. Like you can kind of keep an right. eye. Right. It's an interesting yeah. corner, I would say, in, in the exhibition with Balanchine, Cunningham, mm -hmm. uh, but then also Noguchi sculpture, Martha Graham, and then Yvonne mm -hmm. Rainer's terrain. Mm -hmm. So I think it was like in a very succinct way showing what was going on simultaneously in a way in New York at that moment. So mm -hmm. I thought that that was also an uh, a very uh, a very kind of a smart exhibition strategy because the show couldn't encompass everything so it was really showing okay those things were going on and they were all radical in its own way and they were like precursors to 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 each other in a way also so that was uh, that I think was um talking about dance that's like dance corner it's not even like there are two corners in the exhibitions that I thought were very well done in that sense because of course you cannot you know show uh, everything because when when um, uh, Andre you were talking your introduction uh, about experimentation about how to show past how to open this past to the future and not just be some like, um, you know, documentation in the present. Those were all guiding uh, questions and concerns when we were thinking about the Judson Dance Theater exhibition at MoMA that happened in 2018, 19. And it's also exactly this time period, which it was also, mm -hmm. you know, very compelling to me to, to think about the exhibition because my essay opens with like between 1962 and 1964, there were like 16 courses of dance in the Johnson Memorial Church. And, you know, those questions about what made Johnson happen, how inclusive and exclusive were Johnson together with my, uh, you know, my dearest colleague, uh, TJ Lax, and together with Martha Joseph, we worked for several years, really like meeting and thinking, what does it mean to translate dance, experimentation, improvisation, this very specific moment of the basement in the church into an exhibition like MoMA, you know, into a space also like MoMA. So those, and you know, it was like feeling that then the, the Judson, at least the, the Judson exhibition that we did and the research was like zooming in of what the show represented the Jewish museum. Because of course, as I said, you cannot be, so comprehensive so many things happen so the, this way of like this editing of those simultaneous like dance events in the time were well done while what we did and we was really zooming in between of those two years of what happened with Judson in Judson and what made the Judson happen and of course Deborah was an important interlocutor and also 
we reperform her piece, we can talk, I think, later, what does it mean also to show today uh, a piece from, you know, from, from the 60s, again, in a place like MoMA in an institution like, like MoMA. So mm-hmm. those, those are like very important questions. Yeah. And, and I feel like, in a way, the exhibition opens up the possibility of thinking about those questions in a, in a deeper way. Um, and, and also to assess, you know, um, 60 years later, what remains, what has changed, what are the structural conditions that not only keep some movements in place, but also ask for radical transformation and something else. And I was thinking like, Deborah, your work is, is, is it's very interesting to me because um, I feel there's something that goes on there that is certainly happening at the level of choreography and experimentation. So, so we can see like uh, choreographic devices and we can see composition taking place, but also like in your writing and your practice, you insist on a kind of truth in the body. And you talk about the molecular body, you talk about modes of living that are very, very specific to I guess another way of thinking about blurring life and art, which was one of the one of the uh, one of the aspirations of experimentation, you know, with Capro, Alan Capro, with fluxes, with all sorts of happenings that are taking place. Like, how is it to blur art and life? But mostly that blurry had to do with okay, let's take an art piece and do it in the street or something like that. Or let's create this event that usually is in a theater or even in the basement of a church. But, you know, and this would be like the blurring of art and life. But I have the impression that life for you is something slightly deeper than just the blurring between the public and the private, that there's a practice of living that has to do with your way of approaching dance and approaching the body, what you can call the body. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, because again, like it has to do with time passing and this notion of reenactment that is so present and important in dance, particularly when you are asked by, let's say, by MoMA to, you know, bring a piece back to life. What does that mean? Like, what kind of life do you want to bring it back to? Well, there, there, you know, I I could take over if you want. Um, uh, I'll I'll talk about the piece from MoMA, and I don't know if it's going to address your your question uh, or where you're where you're going with your question. But um, with the piece with MoMA, what I realized it was, so it was fifty years later. I've had I had experienced all this stuff for those 50 years. I wasn't living in a vacuum. I was in practice. I was experimenting with questions over and over again. I, so that when I um, found this most illustrious cast to perform at MoMA, uh, and I thank you, Ralph, um, Many of those cast members, so several of them came from blues from that event at MoMA. <laughs> um, and that was a deliberate choice and also an aesthetic one, not to be separated, not to make a separation. Um, it, I felt like I finally, 50 years later, had the language. That's where the writing comes in, I think. And that's where my own experiments come in. I finally had the language to make happen what I could not have made happen in 1960. It was 1968, in fact. And I feel that uh, I, it was I, what I learned from that, you know, I, I just was, you know, just thrilling to me because number one, I thought I had made a kind of filler piece in 1968. Mm. And uh, when I saw the piece realized in 19, I mean, in 2018, I thought, oh, you know, maybe 
Deborah knew something, but she just couldn't really get to it. It just took 50 years to get to it. So uh, Deborah, if I if I can jump in because yeah. we I, I remember we we were in conversation with you what piece to do uh, in the yeah. in the atrium we had uh, which is like the central part of the museum and it's true you perform already with Ralph Ralph invited you in 2012 yeah. so yes, yes. with a new piece and uh, and then we were like okay what what piece would you do and you you were very precise you knew what piece you wanted to do you said I want to do ten. It was done twice, which consisted of this vertical and horizontal pole, a band that was playing very, very loud, and a group of performers who were like performing, they have this all like group dynamics with like follow the leader, which was also very Jatsuni in a way. And mm -hmm. and uh, and I have to say that the, the performers that would reach out said yes immediately. It was just like, we are ready to do whatever you ask us for, for, for Deborah. And we had this like, you know what, what were you talking andrea like what do we look how are how dance looks we we have those not even i think photos from the 68 but we have this which was interesting the different iteration we have this footage from dance space from 1982 mm. and uh and you know there was something when you did you worked of course you rehearsed you you came to new york you worked in the atrium we we pick up the 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 band gang gang bang there was something of that piece that was so contemporary and powerful and strong that I think we were all blow away. Mm -hmm. It was not mm -hmm. that we were ever doubted that you would do something so incredible, but I think we were not even aware of the potential of that piece. Mm -hmm. As you said, it's like it, after those 50 years, this piece was incredible. You know, there was like the utterance of not hearing each other, trying to work with each other, trying to, someone trying to lead, the other not really following. There were so many things happening that happened in the world that are happening in that piece in front of us that I think that was really, really powerful. And also, mm -hmm. you know, this idea of like reconstruction, how actually it never really works because you have to give this space of imagination when you're redoing mm -hmm. something. Of course, it was amazing because we could work with you and you know, you also knew what people you wanted in the piece, which I think that was also because each of those, you know, David Thompson, Shelley Center, they were like mm -hmm. many of them, they also have their own experience. They also have their own things to, that they brought and they know exactly what they were doing. You know, they know the piece from 68, they know how it was in 68. Like the bodies that performed this piece in 2018 were different bodies that they performed in 68 and 82. Mm -hmm. So that, that I think it was really one of the most successful, you know, re-performances of, of the piece. I yeah, and I, agree. sorry, yeah. go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Rolf, please. I think, too, there was something, and maybe this is something to kind of get at, um, you know, more, and back to your question, Andre, about the past and present, right? Like, I think it's even beyond, like, bringing things forward. I think there was something extraordinary, Deborah, with that piece that it seemed, and maybe this is why it was so, so successful to me as an audience member, is that everyone seemed to be in agreement, mm -hmm. right? With an old idea or concept that was 50 years old, and yet it was, you know, in present time, and you had all these contemporary bodies who absolutely got what you were doing. You had this very exciting modern band who got what it, the idea was. And I think that's, that's extremely extraordinary, you know, like the coming mm -hmm. together where it goes beyond this idea of a reconstruction. Yeah. Like it became modern or contemporary in, in where it sat in that particular moment in time at MoMA. And that's amazing, you know? How does that happen? Because <laughs> I think that's really beyond just, oh, this was a, you know, a really interesting work that happened 50 years ago. Do you know what I mean? Like modernizing the idea of it or something? And mm -hmm. relations, I would mm -hmm. say, you know, yeah. relations that happened. We know with your work, Deborah was a pedagogue, as a teacher, as a choreographer, and right there in those 50 years, and the relationship you had with those people, the relationship you had with Ralph, when you did this, like all a set of relations that informed that piece. 
And I think there is yeah. something about relations that it's so important that we talk about. When we talk about performance, when we talk about free yeah, yeah, performance, yeah. when we talk about how to present things from the past, they're very much based on relations. And that's personally one of the reasons why I enjoy working with, with performance, because I think it's more than any other form it's really fundamental, the, the, the trust, the agreement, the disagreement mm -hmm. that happens at that moment. I also love what you said, Deborah, in relationship to, oh, 50 years late, later, I feel now I have the language. <laughs> so I was thinking like, what yeah. is the time of a work of art specifically in the performing, in the performing world, right? Like we think usually that the time of dance is ephemeral. It just happens in the now and it disappears mm -hmm. and then it can come back again, you know, as a good idea. But to think that there is this 50 year period that the work was working <laughs> somehow yeah. without knowing it. And then it appears yeah, thanks yeah, yeah. to the invitation, thanks to the relations, right. thanks to the language that all of a sudden you mm -hmm. feel that you that you have available to you. That's really, really interesting which again makes me think about the relationship between dance and life. Not that's like move from art and life, but maybe dance and life. And here, like the work of Ralph, I think it's, I want to ask you Ralph, like, because, you know, one of the things that is famous in your, <laughs> in your trajectory is to think about your work also, like as a dancer, then, you know, like, and then you became like a choreographer with your own company. And then there's this moment that I guess is you memorialize in your in your book Geography, which is this moment that you decide to step away from the studio and to go into the world, let's say, go into especially the south of the United States in the early 2000s, already the 90s, right? Like end of 90s, early 2000s. Yeah. And then something happens because you start encountering people that are not necessarily dancers or even artists, right? And that transforms your relationship, I guess, not only to your work, but also like, I guess, how you look at life and particularly black life and sociality. Like, can you talk a little bit about that? And what happens when you have to curate or to present or to display that work, that aspect? This, is this, is this um, how do you display or curate or exhibit it's impossible. So, <laughs> so you you do something else, you know, and I guess this is, I don't know, maybe I was riffing on Deborah, right? Like how you left Judson and went and just started working with people in Austin, right? For how many years? Oh, let's see. Uh, <laughs> 30. Yeah. And then you came back and then something else mm -hmm. happened, you know, mm -hmm. or you came back to New York and something else happened. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, I think for me, like something else keeps happening, you know, like with, you know, taking the ideas of work and my body out of that sort of more conventional container, do you know, of mm -hmm. a studio with trained dancers who's, who are all kind of speaking the same language. Mm -hmm. that, that for me, when I disbanded the company, I, I disbanded because the language was dying for me. I, there, you know, I, I couldn't find any more oxygen in working the way I was working. So I, I, I left and started improvising, you know, and that's with my body, but also culturally. And then, you know, now I'm addicted. So it's, like, so it's just like, I feel like I, the only way to keep this going is to keep improvising, which means I don't know where I am or what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I, and, you know, getting to Anna's point about relationships, it's absolutely all about relationships that flux, but it's like trying to make new friends and trying to find new languages to keep me, you know, unstable. Cause I feel like that's mm -hmm. where I find really interesting things to keep me engaged. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A general, a, that's a general answer to your question. No, no, I was just thinking about this relationship between improvisation and relation and to, to be in a relation, right? Like, I guess like when you, when successful improvisations do happen, it's because you really are in relation, right? And with relation precisely with the unexpected and what you don't know what is coming, but you you accept that, right? And therefore you can find something much more interesting than just yourself. 
you can find like a relation. Yeah, it's beautiful. Um, Anna, did you have like any any highlights from the exhibition? Like anything like as you walked into the exhibition, the Jewish Museum, you know, having curated, you know, being a curator of performance, you know, but thinking also about the very important relationship between, between performance and visual arts, because that's that's something also that unites, I guess, Judson, Deborah's work after Judson, but also Ralph Lemon's work, you know. Um, so I'm just wondering if if you have something you would like to highlight. Yeah, definitely. Well, you know, it's it's really an, an impressive exhibition and it's also an impressive catalog, I will I would also say. And you know, it's it's always a difficult task to do something like that because you always have to decide in a way where are you going, you know. So so I really enjoyed the, as you said, this highlight it was to also showing New York as an important city. I think this is what we also did with Judson. It was like, oh, Judson also happened because there were certain things happening in New York, you know, for like uh, Jane Jacobs, for like the multi multicultural, like civil rights. This was, was also, it was a very rich moment in New York. I think that also inspired, like there was an openness toward artists and art, like having the new art show at the, uh, the uh, at the Jewish Museum, the different galleries, you know, Simone Forti doing the desk constructions before the happening at the Judson Gallery. So there are many things really happening. There are people from everywhere also of the world. So there is this moment, which I think you can, you can feel it. There is like a vibrancy that you can feel in, in the exhibition. There is also, I think, an incredible works that I also didn't know. There were like really some gems, like the Agnes Martin, the Jim Dine. There were really some incredible gems. I, I mm -hmm. felt, you know, I think what was also interesting that the show was curated by Germano Challand, but also like in Post Hum. So we are also, there is this also interesting moment, you know, how do you then transmit this energy or those set of relationship in the show when uh, even if it was done by his studio, I, I felt most of the Germano in the gallery about Venice, I have to say, from some of his previous work, the moment of Rauschenberg and all of them in Venice, I found that that was very, um, that was very compelling with all the archive materials and, 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 and photos. And, you know, and it was also interesting to, you know, coming back with, with, uh, to Ralph's mail, but also something that we thought very much about Judson, and I'm glad to talk how we approach that. It was also this moment of a huge segregation, and how do you how do you talk about that in the in the exhibitions? And this was one of the ways. You know, I I don't think there is a good or a bad way because it's 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 a huge, uh, it, it it's it's a big like you know it's a big challenge it's a big uh, ongoing problem but it was like also this this last room i think uh, more dedicated to you know to to the to the, to the yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 and it was there were also some amazing works so there were works that were talking you know uh, mm -hmm. among each other and you could feel the vibrancy of course two years are huge in a small space, in the space, this is not huge, and then you're going to be encyclopedic. Mm -hmm. So I think the, all those curatorial strategies of how you curate a certain period of time are very um, are very compelling in a way. Because also for Judson, it was you know just to come back in terms of uh, exhibition strategies. How do you show something that was improvisation, that was set of relationship, that was experimentation, that was ephemeral? into an exhibition and then, and mm -hmm. I think that the choice for us it was also to show what brought to Judson which is also very similar in a way which was like the workshop of Anna Halprin and Cage and Dan and James Waring and then the downtown you know what was happening like the Rubin Gallery as I said Jane Jacobs the mm -hmm. uh, the different cafes Jonas Mekas my new theater so mm -hmm. there was like Things are happening, and and yeah, it's 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 interesting. You know, those two years that we pick exactly the same two years when we did uh, with it, mm -hmm. uh, Johnson. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, those are more like my my highlights. There were very yeah. interesting moments happening uh, yeah. in the show. I would say. Yeah, I'll share my highlights, <laughs> which were you know kind of. It was interesting actually to go through the trajectory, the first floor, the second floor, and then end with Venice, right? Uh, the, the, the 1964 Venice that 
uh, Alan Solomon had curated. And for me, it was, oh, obviously, but it's always, it's always a little bit shocking to see like the, there's only men, uh, <laughs> male artists. And then the other thing, perhaps not surprising, but the other thing that really struck me is how today it would be perhaps almost impossible to imagine a really cutting edge exhibition at the Venice Biennial without at least one performance element, right? And performance and performers, even though Rauschenberg was like working closely with, with you know, with uh, Cunningham and others like, but Rauschenberg appears as a painter, as a visual artist, right? So I was thinking about, you know, this, how performance or, or the work of Judson, the work of Ralph, the work of Deborah Hay and many, many others actually really open up the curatorial imagination and really it's impossible to think about such an, I think, um, a contemporary exhibition of, of art or new art uh, without including performance and dance. So that was one thing. The other thing that I, that I kind of discovered was maybe alongside the thought of my colleague here at NYU in performance studies, uh, Fred Moten, who talks about blackness or um, as an ontological force. Um, and there's a few pieces from, from the 60s um, by female artists. There's a Nancy Grossman piece and a Lee Bontuku piece. Um, one is called Black Landscape and the other one is Untitled. Um, in which you see like the way in which a kind of minoritarian position expresses itself through uh, blackness or black element that gained this kind of force actually. And that was really, really interesting. Like these two pieces specifically, the, the untitled piece is a three-dimensional painting that has a hole. I don't know, it's on the first floor. I don't know if you and inside the hole, there's black fabric, but also soot. So there's, um, you know, this kind of burnt uh, black color uh, coming in, and it's kind of a black hole, singularity. There's something, and the and the black landscape is a very disturbing collage of leather and fabric. Um, it's it's very very interesting to think about that. So I was thinking about women. I mean this women artists, black artists, 1962, 1964, and how is it that the exhibition also brings these forces that were not present in Venice in, in the exhibition? So that was, that was interesting for me to see. Mm -hmm. I thought, a, a, and Louise Nevelson's black. And Louise, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. I, but I, I, I wanna say, you know, like, I was around in the 60s, right? I didn't see a, a lot of the women who were merged with the white artists. A lot of the women were not known to me in the 60s. It was really a revolution, uh, yeah. re revelation to me to see some of these women artists in this exhibit. And I thought, isn't it, in terms of the curation, that the women were included in among the the white artists, and yet the black artists, or the you know the whole po political thing was separate. Like, why was one? I and again, it's interesting. I mean, was this a curatory? How do you, how do you how do you mm. bring the awareness of what was happening then? Do you? It, it was separate. Uh, so you keep it separate, or do you make up for it by including it? With, um, it, it? It seems like the curator played it safe in a way, by mm -hmm. by doing both, by including the women who I never knew of, mm -hmm. but not include, I don't know, that mm -hmm. was something that struck me. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I Did think you can, I think you can only attempt it as a sort of correction, right? Just like on the surface, you know, like it, that, because it, it, it was what it was. <laughs> and I think for me that like, what's really interesting that I feel like 
I deal with today and a lot of Black artists deal with today, visual and performance, is this idea of abstraction in Blackness. Do you know? Mm -hmm. And abstraction as white modern art. <laughs> and that, you know, to your point, Deborah, I feel like all these artists were kind of addressing that on their own terms, but being left out of the more um, integrated conversation about it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's so interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're talking about the locus and the locus is about a certain kind of white idea of modern art or art. And yet ever, everyone's really attracted to that locus beyond their gender or race with in you know specifically the black artists in the show were certainly informing abstraction you know with a certain kind of political body black body take that they had no choice but to kind of address it as such mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i feel like that's happening right now which is really interesting do you know Mm -hmm. abstraction ab abstraction representing what a certain kind of purity of ideas or you know a human relationship to material which a black body can't really do or a female body can't really do societally you know i don't know mm -hmm. I, I just do, you know, talking about, and, and sorry if I'm coming back to the Judson show, but it's, you know, it, as I said, it was interesting to see the different uh, curatorial strategies, uh, you know, for this period of time. When, when we approached Judson, it was very clear that it was a, you know, uh, a white phenomena in a way. And the, 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 the artists, choreographers, dancers, mu mu musicians were mainly white. It was also to think, to go deeper in a way and uh we did a lot of oral histories with many of the of the judson participants and i love how carly schneeman told us that judson was basically a business of women there were mainly women at judson they were the driving <laughs> force behind mm -hmm. judson and so it's yeah. also interesting at your point and um andre that how you know they're like the the women are then you know in a way segregated into dance and and performance mm -hmm. and if you think about you know i remember when i asked deborah i was like deborah you were almost in every performance at the time like not only as a choreographer but also the dancer and yvonne rainer and ruth emerson like they were the one who came mm -hmm. Carmine and were like okay with steve paxton but you know and there were also queerness at judson which mm -hmm. is also something that we we went deeper and also the, the the fact that the church the church the Judson Memorial Church was a very progressive church so there were like a very social approach and there were connection with the civil rights movements and the church a lot they're like in the in the text by Tilax in the catalog he's also like giving very concrete examples of that and so, you know, it was also so a place that allowed certain experimentation was also a very progressive uh, place in a way. So like what were, were the modes of production at the time, which I always thought it was interesting. So yes, they just gave him them the basement, but why they gave them the basement to this group of artists to do certain things, which were, you know, also very uh, um progressive when you can you know show the two men live together two women live together what was happening in life it was happening also on the stage from the clothes from the movement but also mm -hmm. you know then going like deeper and seeing you know that Cecil Taylor played at the first concert of Judson that the floating bear the newsletter that was distributed it was like edited by Dan De Prima and Leroy Jones and you know so that there were those connections that you then then want to over you know, to just overemphasize because that wouldn't be the right way because the segregation existed, but they were like the five spot cafe where they were all hanging out. So there were those connections like Bill Dixon, he, he performed also with Judith Vance. So the music that they were listening at the time. So the connections were there, but they were not deep enough and the segregation existed but and it so what for us it was important when we when we thought about the show to show those connections uh during the show you know to show how it was somehow um let's say um 
how Justin proposed that language of an ongoing experimentation that somehow was able was trying to dismantle some male dominated, you know, discourse at the time with those connections with they have with black culture at, at the time. And so trying to do it through through the show, but as, as, as Ralph said, the things were very deep. So there is not one really way to do it and, and they were real, but this was like to think, okay, this was also a minoritarian group. And so they, they had, uh, certain connections so it was like the whole trajectory of how you go also you know not that we believe really in genealogies but more let's say in, in, in trajectories mm -hmm. that's really interesting but then I was, I'm wondering in relationship to abstraction Ralph that you just mentioned but um, there were so thinking about um, this relationship to the past but also like a kind of obligation or duty or desire to keep producing, to keep offering the world, to keep creating relations as artists with the world. In, in other words, uh, with other people that we work with, with other materials. I'm just wondering, Deborah, maybe, and Ralph, like, do you want to talk a little bit about what is, what is really interesting for you right now? And if there's anything that lingers from that past or is, how, what are you working with right now? What what is what is making you move? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, one thing is, um, I I uh, I I never felt like I could approach a piece of, about subject matter. Uh, I, I just never could. I, I just never felt I was smart enough in any way. And that this is really true and big deal, it's okay. But I never felt like I could approach something in terms of subject matter. And so I really went to my body as to save me, you know. Uh, I just needed to uh, learn from her. That's what I could, that's what I could do. I knew I was her and uh, and um, and then you know I just figured out a way um, for her to um, in, in inform me of of what I needed from one moment to the next, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that continues. Mm -hmm. And um, because her you know, is always I, changing, also. Oh, it's always changing, and I, you know, I think you know, you know, I had questions, and quest. I use questions to learn from her. Questions, you know, that I address to my whole body, right? Mm -hmm. oh, over years and years of question, this question, and then I moved to the next question, just because that's what came up, and then the next question, and I learned, 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 and um, I've graduated. I I don't have questions anymore. I feel like I have something that I. Mm. Uh, that I know, and uh, I know that I can't know what I know, <laughs> and uh, that's <laughs> just gorgeous to dance. That is, there's just doesn't nothing comes close to that. So that's where I am now. Uh, mm. That is beautiful. And and in a way, like, I don't know, does it relate, Rolf, to what you're saying about improvisation and not, not knowing, and but yet wanting to keep doing something? I don't know. What, what's moving you right now? Well, Deborah has certainly been a guide. <laughs> <laughs> and I think for me, it's, it's, you know, it gets back to, I think, you know, my, I, I suppose I have a couple like centers, you know, I have the center that just wants to not know. And then I have another center that is, you know, my placement kind of in the world and in our particular American society where, you know, I have a black male body. And it's interesting because I, you know, I moved to, I left a, a black urban environment in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1963. 
and moved to Minneapolis, right, in 1963, which was a, you know, Nor American Norwegian, <laughs> uh, white, snow white body, <laughs> you know, cultural, like, weather society. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, like, I, I was swamped in whiteness when I moved to Minneapolis. And not only like its landscape and its people, but just like aesthetically and creatively, you know? Mm -hmm. Then I graduated with high, from high school, I went to the Walker and, you know, that was, Judson was there all the time, like, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so I fell in love with that, that particular kind of work with this black body. And, and you know, so for, specifically, Bruce Nauman was very important for you, right? Like this right? Nauman's later, but you know, Mer I moved to Minneapolis because of Merce. So Merce mm -hmm. has been a mini god, like all that he represents. And mm -hmm. and he didn't dance with a black body till Ulysses Dove in 1970. It didn't matter, you know. So for me, it's been a kind of seesaw of really understanding that kind of clarity of you know, working without knowing that Deborah is describing that's in your bones, <laughs> right? It's not fake, it's real. And for me, it's, I feel like it's in my spirit, but there's, there's always an argument. Do you know what I mean? That there, mm -hmm. there's only so far I can mm -hmm. go with the not knowing, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so I found a way to use, find a balance or an equipoise in that argument within my body. And then that become, has become the work. Mm -hmm. And it feels very vital and, and interesting and, and ongoing, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting because in a way, like, not only does, you know, what Deborah just said, like, I guess you write about it in my body, uh, the Buddhist, your book, Deborah. Uh, which is a book that I really, really love. And in a way, there's a relationship to that, not knowing, but also like that not knowing actually keeps you moving because you need to be in the state of errancy and errantry, like, you know. And I feel like this is the same that happened to you, Ralph, like as you kept walking, kept going and finding other places. And there's something about these procedures from the the late 50s, early 60s that have also to do somehow with emphasizing a little bit of not knowing. We, we started talking about Merce Cunningham. That was the first thing that Deborah brought in today. And it's interesting that like Cage and Merce are here as the ones who, you know, they're so influential to not only to Judson and to the Judson generation, but also to bring chance procedures not so sure if improvisation is the right word, but kind of hyper relationality to other other stuff that was not part of the of the daily life of making dances, let's say. Um, so, and that's really interesting. And I'm wondering, you know, since we have a curator here, like Anna, is there a place for improvisation and curation? Like, is there like something from these artistic procedures that we're talking about that still even if it's in a transformed way, percolating through our imaginations today and modes of making, is there anything that translates to curatorial practice for you? Like this art, in, you know, this particular art procedures that we're talking about inform the way you curate? Absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I was very fortunate that when, when I moved to New York, one of the first people I encountered were Ralph, actually. And, <laughs> And so it's been 10 years ago. And I, for me, it's a driving force. It's a way of thinking. And also you, Andre and, and Deborah. So I'm, I'm completely thrilled to be on this panel because those are like my, my heroes, how to say, in how I think curatorially, uh, you know? So the, what they described about what I, I, I experienced with Deborah Stan, it completely under, make me understood, you know, these things, what I said about relations, you know, and, and Andre, you're thinking about the afterlives of performance for me, and I know also for my colleagues were crucial uh, of thinking, because, you know, it's true, I'm more focused on, on, on performance, but there is something 
that you learn, you know, at least for me, and it was about, you know, not, there is no dominant narrative, there is no dominant canon, there are things that are happening simultaneously, there are no masterpieces, uh, you know, there is like an openness to imagination, even when you think there is not, even when you have an object, there is a conversation that you can have with an artist uh, when when you think about the exhibitions that can be very important. The, the, the way that you direct the audience in an exhibition, this is something that I think I really learned from all mm. the choreographers uh, uh, I work with. The, um, uh, you know, the idea of what is a photo, what is a film, what is an ephemera, what is a poster and how you can translate them. This is also something I think that was very, very important for me in, in, in thinking how to contextualize and how, what is documentation, you know, and what is this gap between what, what happened and what is here. And also, you know, how this tension with improvisation and, and history and like it's, 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 it's very real, but how there is a way that can live mm -hmm. together, uh, I, I, I think. And, mm -hmm. But for that, you need really an, an openness and not have fixed idea, but really to understand the parallel things that are happening in, in the art world, in dance. And that's why I said I loved this moment at the Jewish Museum, because it was like showing what happens parallel and how mm -hmm. things actually inform each other. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, and just you think about how many of the visual artists were informed by dance at the time. I know that we mentioned that, but there were a lot. And I think, for example, for us, it was a del in, in the Judson show was a deliberate decision to say, we, but we don't want to show them because you don't want to justify what mm -hmm. is happening with the artworks. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, it was really, yeah, I, absolutely everything you mentioned, you mentioned, and I mentioned, it's really a guiding force in mm -hmm. thinking about exhibitions, in thinking about programming, in thinking also what each project want to communicate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really nice. In the, I mean, yes, and actually in the, the last room, you know, the Venice Biennale room, there are traces of dance in the paintings, right? Yeah. Even though dance is not necessarily present, but you can see like the presence of those traces and this influence, this kind of ghostly presence, which is really nice. Okay, I think this is like about, about our time, but I'm wondering if there's any last words that you want to say, or penultimate words from <laughs> Deborah and 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 Ralph and Anna, like you know, any urgent last thought, penultimate thought. I was thinking about the performance, the possibilities that maybe <clears throat> not only at present, but just like historically that performance in a modern sense has offered the larger art world. You know, in that Jim Dine essay in the catalog, he spoke of how Merce and John kind of were a magnet for, you know, mm -hmm. like all these other visual artists. I mean, he didn't go into depth of why, but just I think like they offered a certain kind of possibility that the visual art world didn't have you know mm -hmm. which, which mm -hmm. is really interesting yeah it's really and it goes back to the beginning of the conversation when deborah brought Merce that video right? right i think i think deborah i think the word that you used was uh Merce was giving permission kind of like 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 this yeah. is okay we can do this let's, right. let's go for it right right yeah yeah. And I think it's like permission. I take I would take it to a little further. It's like permission to like not have a frame <laughs> or to take the frame apart or change the frame, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Not only for the artist, but also for the audience, right? That's yeah. the yeah. Mm -hmm. let's break down the frames. For me, it, it was also uh, you know, that all brings me to this concept of collective imagination which mm -hmm. I think it was so much present mm -hmm. when you think about instructions and scores from the past, you know, and, and how to interpret them and what, what does it mean? And what you say, like this frame also for the audience, because the audience also at that moment become, is becoming the part of the, of the work, is becoming 
uh, the, the, the part of the, of the project. So for me, what was also some kind of a leading, leading thought this last year was this idea of collective imagination, which mm. the possibility of a collective imagination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And that brings me to <laughs> when I visited the show this last Thanksgiving, I went with my brother and um, he was standing in front of a painting. I was about, um, I would say I was about 12 to 15 feet away from him watching him. And my brother it didn't move and uh, the experience and I, I, what I, and I just saw a body that was still and patient. And I felt like I could see for the very first time in my life, I swear, I felt like I could see transmission taking place. And I thought, if you think about relationship and all the ways we're impacted by our by life around us that we don't notice. You know, we don't, we, we don't notice. And the fact that he was so still and patient and, and who knows how, how, what his experience of that painting was. And that was his, and that was, that's passed on. And it was just mm -hmm. like one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, I, I, I feel like it describes to me the experience of relationship, of what, what, what relationship is, is transmission. It's we're changed by how we see, we're changed. And, you, and I could see that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's really beautiful because that's, you know, all we need to do is to try to transmit the mm -hmm. best that we can of the best that we have, right? But we um, don't even have to, it's happening anyway. It's happening, That's right? It's happening <laughs> it's anyway. Already taking... He didn't know he was, you know, I don't, you know, I don't think anybody else saw it, but you know, who knows if I really saw it, but that's, it's happening and we don't know it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's a better ending. <laughs> 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 well what a luxury like mm. you you i mean you are my hero so it's mm. such a luxury so beautiful thank you so much it's great yeah. thank you do... for putting us together this was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. let's let's do it again this is just the beginning yeah. right <laughs> let's do it again let's do it like in philadelphia in austin in new york like let's yeah. just do it yeah beautiful yeah. Thank you. Thank you.